Well, let's uh, get into some prayer. We're going to ask the Lord to guide us and then we're going to look at his word. Our Father, thank you for how we can come and sing those great uh, celebration songs of the resurrection. And we know that we can do that right throughout the year. But this morning, as you know, this is a, a day when we actually do set aside time to remember this incredible event. <coughs> and we ask that you would help us as we, we come and consider uh, this Gospel of Mark this morning. I know we looked at the Gospel of Mark on Good Friday. And as we look at the Gospel of Mark for the Resurrection Sunday, we ask that you would lead us in your truth and help us to, to take in these great words, that they would have this impact that should ha we should have on our life. Please would you speak to us, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when something extraordinary happens, something miraculous, something magnificent, there's no end to the newspaper reports that are written about it. Isn't that true? But what I find so intriguing about the Gospel of Mark is that we have only eight verses to describe this most magnificent event called the resurrection. And just to give you a bit of background, in Mark's Gospel, I thank the Lord for the excellent scholarship we have. We understand that the first eight verses were in the original uh, Mark's Gospel and verses 9 to 20 were added on later on. So if you think about what was originally written, there was only eight verses. Do you get it? Eight verses to describe the most incredible event. How do you feel about that? And even though it's only eight verses, there's three words in there that mean everything. In fact, that's what it really is all about. It's he has risen. That's it. That's just three words. That's the most important thing that we're meant to grasp hold of when we think of the uh, resurrection account. So Mark does not have in the first eight verses anything about Peter and John running to the tomb and Mary Magdalene weeping near the tomb when a gardener comes alongside her and it happened to be the Lord, risen. She was the first one to see Jesus. It doesn't have any mention of the, uh, of the disciples seeing the risen Jesus on that Sunday night in a, in a locked room or Thomas a week later seeing the Lord Jesus after he doubted. That's all in John's Gospel. You've got to go to John's Gospel for that. Or what about Luke's Gospel? I love that story of the two on the road to Emmaus. And you see those two, they're walking along and a stranger joins them. And it happens to be Jesus. Wow. Mark's just like straight to the point. We won't worry about all those stories. What you need to know is this. He is risen. And our response should be, he's risen indeed. Mark's a short Gospel. Punchy. That's it. That's what it's all about. All the other stories are great. But the most important thing is that, this is it, he has risen. And that's what the uh, angel said to the, the woman in verse 6, Mark chapter 16, verse 6, the angel said, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. Praise the Lord. Rightio, so um, this morning, as we consider uh, this gospel account of the resurrection, we do have eight verses, eight wonderful verses, we're going to explore these verses together. We're going to look at the resurrection and then we're going to look at the ramifications of the resurrection, the great truth in regards to Jesus being risen from the dead. So let's have a look at these verses now from Mark's Gospel. So I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome um, they brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. So here we have just a, a very beautiful account of what was going on on that first Sunday. So the first thing I want to say to you all is, look at this, look at the women. What are they doing? They're going to the tomb to anoint a dead Jesus, not to embrace the risen Jesus. It's so clear. They are not expecting him to be alive. They've got spices in their hands, a Jewish custom, to anoint a dead body, not to apply it to a living body. They are convinced that Jesus is dead. And so there they go. They're also going to the tomb early in the morning. They're in a hurry. Why are they in a hurry? Because they know 
that Jesus' body would be decaying by this stage and his body would probably have a stench, just to make things pretty clear to you all, they missed out on anointing his body earlier. Normally it happens straight after death. But what happened straight after death? Well, Joseph of Arimathea took down Jesus' body and placed it in a garden tomb and then bang, the Sabbath started. No work on the Sabbath. They couldn't do anything. They had to wait for the next day. That was the Sabbath day and then early, see how it says early? Early in the morning, they bolted to the tomb in order to, to anoint the body of Jesus, to do this Jewish custom or Middle Eastern custom. So off they went. I love this, don't you love the simplicity and the beauty of the story? There they are, going to, into a tomb where they were going to anoint uh, the dead body of Jesus. So, let's have a look at a few other things. Let's read now verses 3 and 4 of Mark 16. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Well, that's a really good thing to think about, all right? They got the spices, but they, they knew where the tomb was and they knew a big stone had been put against that uh, tomb and they're sort of wondering who's going to roll it. So you know, can you just imagine this? You've got to imagine this whole thing. There they are, they've got spices and they're walking along. Who's, what are we going to do when we get there? How are we going to open the tomb? All right. And verse 4 says, uh, Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. And Mark's the only uh, gospel that tells us that that stone was like really big. It's a big boulder, all right? So it's, um, it's been placed against that tomb and those women weren't going to be able to shift it. But when they get there, it's already been moved. All right, what a surprise that would be. Also, just so you know, um, if we think of Matthew's gospel, Matthew's gospel tells us not only was it a big boulder in front of the tomb, but there had been a guard set there and that the stone had been sealed in, you know, like concreted in. And why was that? Because the religious leaders wanted to make sure nobody tampered with the body of Jesus. No one's going to get in, and definitely no one's going to get out. All right, that's what they thought. In fact, we should read that. In Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 27, we read in verses 62 to 66, halfway through verse 62, we pick it up. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he, that's Jesus, was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. And I've got to just pause here. They seem to be the only ones who remember what Jesus said. The woman didn't. The disciples sure didn't. But they remember. Isn't that interesting? All right, verse 64. Therefore they said to Pilate, Give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples come and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Well, let me just assure you, before I read on, those disciples were not even thinking like that at all. <laughs> were they? They were in hiding. They weren't thinking of knocking off the body and saying he's alive. They were hiding because they thought they might be the next ones to be crucified. Anyway, the religious leaders were thinking of all, other, all sorts of possibilities. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. They knew about mortar in those days, concrete. They sealed it. So how incredible, when the women come to the tomb, this mighty big boulder, the seal's been broken and it's been moved. What do you think? Pretty impressive. All right, so now we come to verses 5 and 6. Now here we go, this is like just totally out of this world, right? Just got to imagine how the women would feel. Verse 5, entering the tomb... They saw a young man, an angel, sitting at the right wearing a white robe and they were amazed. So they've entered the tomb and they see someone in the tomb. But it's not Jesus. It's, this white, it's a man dressed in white robe, an angel, the other gospels say. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene 
who has been crucified. He has risen. He's not here. Behold, here is a place where they laid him. Like, I would have fallen over flat by then. What do you reckon? <laughs> what? Then they are with spices in their hands. Coming to anoint Jesus, dead body, and they've just been told, he's not here, have a look. He's not here. He has risen. Wow. You can imagine those women just being beside themselves. And that wasn't the end of it. In verse 7, the angel said, But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Not only had Jesus been risen from the dead, the angel said to them, You're going to see him. You and the disciples and even Peter, who denied Jesus three times. Peter's mentioning it lovely. The angel was told by God, don't forget to mention Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times. I love that. He hasn't been forgotten. What a love. What a love Jesus has for his people. And so, so what, what, how would you be if you were one of those women, eh? I think verse 8 sort of captures it. It says, They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They just were so overwhelmed by it. And friend, I want you to realise that as Mark records this account here for us, just those eight verses, he's helping us to realise this is not fake news. This reads absolutely true, doesn't it? This is not a made-up story. The women weren't trying to make up some pretend story that Jesus was alive. The disciples definitely weren't. The fact is that none of them were expecting it. But the reality is Jesus conquered death. He came alive. And that excites me no end, doesn't it? He's alive. We're not holding on to some fictitious story, some made-up story, some myth, some legend, some fake news that seems to be around everywhere these days. This is the truth. Jesus conquered the grave. He came alive. Oh, praise his name. So that's the account we have in Mark's Gospel, short and sweet. Three words. He has risen. Take it in. He has risen. Take it in. This is glorious. And yet, whoever added the next part of Mark's Gospel, that's fine. Let's read verses 9 to 14. Or you can read John's Gospel and you can read Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. And in Mark's Gospel, you like have a bit of a summary of the things that happened. Because after Jesus rose from the dead, he did, like the angel said, he did reveal himself to those women and to those disciples. And we have wonderful accounts of it. And for 40 days, he revealed that he was alive. He had, a, had experienced a physical resurrection. The tomb was empty because his body had been transformed and made alive. That's how it is. The resurrection is not a spiritual resurrection as some people think of it. He, he, he uh, was raised from the dead in, in a bodily form. So let's have a read now of verses 9 to 14. And it says there, Now after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had um, cast out seven demons. And I love that. That's in John's Gospel. It's good to read John's Gospel and to see this beautiful story where Mary is just beside herself crying. She's thinking that somebody has knocked off the body of Jesus. And, and she thinks this person who comes behind her is actually uh, the gardener. And she thought, he's the one who's knocked off the body. She had no idea she was talking to Jesus until he said to her, Mary. <laughs> and she knew straight away. She turned around, there he was, the risen Jesus. She's the first one who saw Jesus alive. Verse 10 says, She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were uh, mourning and weeping. And verse 11, When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. That's exactly right. The disciples are not going to hear some stupid story like that. They're not going to believe it, but it's the truth. No matter how Mary and the other women explain it to the disciples, they wouldn't believe it. Verse 12, After that he appeared in a different form to two of them, while they were walking along on their way to the country. They called the two, we don't know their names, really clear passage one, two on the road to Emmaus. And uh, this is a beautiful story in Luke's Gospel. They're walking along, 
talking about all the things that had happened that weekend, Jesus dying and the rumour that he had come alive and a stranger comes along and walks alongside these two. And the stranger goes and says to them, so what are you talking about? Sort of paraphrasing it. Oh, we're talking about these things. Don't you know these things? Everyone's been talking about them. Now what things? <laughs> and Jesus is playing dumb and he wants them to tell him what's going on. And it's not till the end of that conversation that they realise the stranger is Jesus. He'd been walking along with us. Wow. What an incredible story that is. And verse 13 says in Mark 16, they went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. They had to run. They ran all the way back to Jerusalem to tell the good news, but the disciples still wouldn't believe. And then we have in Mark's Gospel, verse 14. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. That, that moment came when they saw the risen Jesus. And, and Jesus has to reproach them. Because they should have known better. He had told them that he would come alive from the dead. That's what the angel said to the women. He had told them many times. I'm going to suffer and die, then I'm going to rise again. The Old Testament prophecies say that he's going to rise from the dead. It does. It shouldn't have been news. They should, the women should have been going to the tomb rejoicing, singing hallelujah, ready to embrace the risen saviour. The disciples should have been going with them. But the no one went. Jesus has to um, reproach them for their lack of faith and also for not believing the testimony of those who had seen the risen Jesus. Wow. So this is the account we have in, in Mark's Gospel. I want to say this again to you all, especially in the world we live in. What a cynical world we live in. What a world that just wants to throw Jesus out. He has risen. That's it. No matter what people might think, no matter how strong things are going against the Christian faith, the Lord Jesus rose from the dead and that makes all the difference in the world. Rightio. Now I'm going to say, uh, just spend some time looking at the ramifications, even for us who live in the 21st century, well, nearly 2,000 years later, the ramifications in regards to Christ rising from the dead. And I've picked seven. Seven's a good number, isn't it? That's God's number. All right, here's some seven big ones. I hope you can remember them. Remember them all the days of your life. Here are the seven. The first one is this. The resurrection declares to us all, the whole world, it declares to the whole world that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah, that's right. This is what the resurrection does. There's a great verse on this. Romans chapter 1, verse 4. He was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. I love that verse. Near the beginning of Romans. And it tells us so clearly there that the resurrection affirms to us this Jesus is the Son of God. He is not just a moral teacher. He is not just a religious guru. He is not some prophet. He is the Son of God. He is not... Anyone like Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, he's head and shoulders above all them because they died. He rose from the dead. He's the son of God. His whole life showed him. His miraculous birth. The way he could heal the sick and raise the dead and calm the storm and all those things. It all affirmed who he was, but the resurrection seals it. That's it. This is it. The resurrection. He's the son of God. And friends, in our world that's hostile to the Christian faith, never let the lies and the deceits of the world get to you. This Jesus is the Son of God. Even though he came so humbly into our world, so plainly, even though people could dismiss him just to be just another man, he truly is the Son of God. And how do we know? Because he was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Amen. Right, what's the second big thing? The second big thing in terms of the resurrection is that the resurrection affirms to us that we are saved. 
you know that? <laughs> We're saved. Because God raising his son from the dead means he is well pleased with Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. We can be absolutely sure we're forgiven. The cross, it did it because the resurrection affirms it. So we can be so thankful, so delighted that all our sins have been forgiven, the debt's been paid, we truly are saved. And there's a great verse on this in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Romans 4, verse 25. He was delivered up for our transgressions and was raised for our justification. Notice that last bit. It talks about him dying upon the cross for our sins, our transgressions, but he was raised for our justification. What that last bit means is when he was raised from the dead, God was able to look upon his son's sacrifice and say, accepted. The resurrection affirms to us God's acceptance and that we stand justified before a holy God. What a wonderful feeling that is. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We are guilty before a holy God. Christ's sacrifice and the resurrection affirms it, says to us, you're forgiven. You stand right with God. No matter what you've done, no matter what you will do. Praise the Lord. That's why the resurrection is so important. Thirdly, when I think about the resurrection, we also have this great truth. We have a living saviour, not a dead saviour. And this living saviour is at the right hand of the Father, ever living to do something. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. What a verse. Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, He is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Friends, that's a great picture to have in your mind. That you have a living saviour who every day is interceding for you, Ian, and for you. When we mess up, when we sin, we have a saviour who can show the Father his wound marks and to cover us for all our sins, ever living to intercede, guaranteeing, making sure that we are saved, that we're going to be there one day in glory. See how the resurrection comes into this too. He ever lives before the throne interceding for us. That's a very precious truth. How good it is to see that. It's not a matter of, right, Jesus saved you, it's all up to you now. You better run pretty well, better keep your track record really good. It's not like that at all. <laughs> None of us would ever make it. We have a saviour who ever lives to intercede for us. Not just sitting back, not just waiting in heaven to come. He's actually actively involved in praying for us and helping us in this life. Okay, the fourth one. Because of the resurrection, we have a sure and absolutely rock solid and certain hope. And there's a great verse on that. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says... Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a... What is that? Come on, you should know this. A living hope through, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hallelujah. You know, it's not like a hope so. It's a hope sure. And why do we have a sure hope? Because Jesus rose from the dead. We have an inheritance. He's got a place he's prepared for us. We have a sure hope because Jesus rose from the dead. I often view the, um, the cross as the place where Jesus paid the penalty for my sins. And when Jesus rose from the dead, that's when he broke open the gates of heaven so that we can come through. The resurrection. What a hope we have. When we die, we go to be with the Lord. Praise his name. And let's talk about the fifth big thing about the resurrection. We will not die. What? What's going on there? We will not die. Well, let's listen to Jesus' words. In John chapter 11, speaking to a lady called Martha, after her brother Lazarus had died, Jesus said to her in John 11, 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if they die. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe those words? 
What's that saying to us? Is because Jesus rose from the dead, when a Christian, a person who trusts in Jesus, they die, they, the death for us is nothing but a doorway into the glorious presence of the Lord. That's why Jesus could say you won't die. Because as soon as you expire here on earth, you go straight to be with me and you're ever living. Wow, isn't that great? Got to read those words again. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if they die. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So says the one who conquered death. And I believe his words. <clears throat> All right, and a few more to go. I think there's only two more to go. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, there's a big one. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's a risen saviour. Are you excited about that? Because he rose from the dead, he's coming back. When the time's right, he's coming back. And I love how it's put in Acts chapter 1. When uh, Jesus ascends to heaven before the disciples' very eyes. And then an angel or two, I think it's two angels, come and they say, Men of Galilee, Acts chapter 1 verse 11. Why do you stand looking into the sky? Can you imagine that? They're looking up there, he's gone. He's gone to heaven. But the angels say to them, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. He's coming back. And the Bible talks a lot about that. He's coming back and every eye will see him. He's coming back and every sceptic in this world will be absolutely shocked because they will realise he did rise from the dead. Wow, what a day of reckoning. Do you believe that he's alive? Praise the Lord if you do. If you don't, you're going to find out one day and it'll be too late. And then the seventh one I've got here, and I know I could keep going, but the seventh one is, when he returns, because he was raised from the dead, we will have resurrected bodies too. And some of you older people, I know you're looking forward to that. A new body. <laughs> is that right? What, what, what do you reckon? Yes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> A new body. And we've got to read this. All because Jesus rose from the dead. He's the first one, it says. Uh, Rod's going to look at that in 1 Corinthians 15. He's the first one because there's going to be many others who will be raised from the dead too. That's us who trust in him. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 15 to 17, we read these words. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. And I love that little phrase, fallen asleep. That's how God views them. They're, they're, they're withered in heaven, but their bodies have fallen asleep because one day they're going to be awakened. Okay, keep reading verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Can you imagine that, eh? That day when Jesus returns... Everyone who loves the Lord Jesus, who put their faith in him, they're going to be coming back with Jesus. Their spirit and soul is coming back. And then whether you, your body was lost at sea or, or cremated or buried in a grave, the Lord Jesus, by his awesome resurrection power, is going to raise those bodies up. I remember thinking, especially at a burial, like when Mayo O'Brien, we buried Mayo O'Brien's body, I was thinking, wow, here we lay her body. And the day will come when that body will break forth from that grave and she'll have a brand new glorious body that will live forever. Just like Jesus' body, but without the wound marks. Wow. And then it goes on to say, verse 7, I nearly forgot this bit. What about us who are alive when Jesus returns? Well, it answers that. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And 1 Corinthians 15, that Rod will be looking at, talks about, it has a little phrase, in the twinkling of an eye. I, 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 you know, it's going to be great if we're here when the Lord returns. Be tough time beforehand. But when he comes back, you're going to be flying. You're going to be going upward to meet the Lord in the air. And as you go up, your earthly body will be transformed to be an eternal, glorious body because of Jesus' power because of his resurrection from the dead. Pretty amazing. No wonder we get excited about the resurrection. <laughs> I mentioned seven big things to you. Can you remember them? 
He's the son of God. Your salvation is secure. He ever lives to intercede for you to guarantee your salvation. Better have a look at my notes. What else was there? We've got a living hope. We will not die. Death is but a doorway into glory. He's coming back. Maybe I've missed one. Oh yeah, he's a resurrection and the life. And the other one, the last one is, is that we will have resurrected bodies at his return. Wow. Now, do you understand, because of the significance of the resurrection, that is why there have been so many people who've wanted to destroy it. You know that, don't you? Lee Strobel, Josh McDowell, people who have got out of their way, these atheists, to destroy the resurrection because they know if they destroy the resurrection, then Jesus is not the Son of God. You're not saved, you Christians. You're just like the rest of us. There's no hope. It's all about what you want to make of life and all this stuff, right? But every time these people try, they fail. Josh McDowell failed. And he humbled himself before Jesus and said, You are the Lord. And Lee Strobel was broken and humbled himself before Jesus and said, You are alive. I give my life to you. Wow! Because he truly is alive. And the whole world needs to know that. It should be on every newspaper today. Jesus is alive. He's our only hope. We must trust in him. And if you haven't done that yet, I urge you to do that today. You just simply need to pray. First of all, you've got to believe who he is. He's God's son. He died on the cross for your sins and rose again. And our response is to believe in him. And believing in him means believing that he's God's son and I need him to save me from my sins and I trust my life to him. That's what you've got to do. And I love, um, I'm going to finish on these words that Jesus spoke back to John chapter 11. I never read a part of it. John chapter 11, Jesus speaking to Martha. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if they die. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he said something to her. Do you believe this? That's the question. I love her response. She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who came into our world. Praise the Lord. Master's in glory. And so can we be if we put our faith in Jesus. All right, wow. So yes, on Friday I felt a bit, a bit uh, flat and sad after the service. I think of the gravity of the, of the death of Jesus. I think of my sins that placed him there. Of my shame and my sin. But this morning as I arise, I can't help but be filled with excitement. That we have a, a living Saviour. Even though I put Jesus to, to death, because of my sins, I know he came alive. And one day we're going to be with him forever. Oh, praise his name. If you have any questions about Jesus, if you haven't come to know Jesus, and uh, I urge you to come and see Rod or myself and, and to talk to us about it. And we're going to finish with this uh, song now. Just thinking of the weekend we've had. What a blessed weekend. What a special time we have. Good Friday and Easter Sunday. I picked a song that is about Jesus' death and resurrection and coming again. Oh, praise the name. Let's stand and sing.
pray. I'm going to read to you one of my favourite verses in Revelation. Believe it or not, I've got lots, but here's one, right? <laughs> I love this part in Revelation 1 where the Apostle John, uh, the beloved disciple to Jesus, uh, he sees the risen Jesus in all his power and glory. His faith is shining like the sun. And then we read these words. When John, I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Can you imagine that moment when John see, saw Jesus in this vision? And the thing that's so striking about this, even though Jesus is full of power and glory now, clothed with majesty, do you pick up something incredible? John has bowed himself low to the ground and the great king stoops down to touch John's shoulder. What an expression of his love for his people. The one who died for us and rose again. We are his people if we have trusted in him. What a most incredible scene that was when, when I read that. Let's pray. Now, Father, we know when we think of the resurrection, we can think of that awesome power of yours to reverse death, for Jesus to break free of death. But even though it's all done in awesome power, we also understand that this, this great resurrection is all part of... Uh, affirming to us our salvation, sealing the deal, helping us to realise that we truly are saved in Jesus. And even that last reading, to see the Lord Jesus in all his glory, just stooping down to touch John, what a loving act that is. The great King who died on the cross for us should stoop down and touch us. And thank you that that's what he continues to do. Thank you, Father, for your wonderful Son who ever lives to, to love us and intercede for us and pray before your throne for us. Thank you that he will see it through where we come to be in glory one day, despite how up and down we are. We thank you for all our hope is in Jesus and how certain that hope is because you, Father, raised him from the dead. And we are so delighted in that. And we do look forward to the day when he returns, as that hymn puts it, our eyes will be gazed, uh, fixed upon him. And we thank you for that great day that we believe is so near. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on Jesus until that final day comes, whether we go to be with him or whether he comes. And Lord, I just want to ask for everyone here, you know, Lord, if we are truly your children, saved by your grace through faith, and if we're not, I just ask that you would speak to our hearts and help us to realise that Jesus is real. Please, would you help us to understand our absolute need for him. Please would you help us to turn to him today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>